Morning, Emmanuel. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Proverbs, chapter 31. And uh, three months or so ago, when I was planning out the Proverbs sermon series, I, I had ho- high hopes. And I'll, I'll just tell you from my own perspective, I've been very encouraged by these sermons over the last uh, number of months. Really thankful for the brothers who preached them and have been personally helped by them. And I have the privilege of uh, closing out this series uh, this morning as we look at the last half of the last chapter of the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 31. Uh, Let me read that to you. You can read it with me if you open up a copy of the Scriptures. Uh, Ben made it clear he didn't care if you open it up on your phone or on your paper Bible. I am, of course, just slightly more legalistic than that and prefer your paper Bible. But uh, either way, uh, you can open whatever copy of Scripture you want and we'll all fellowship together in Jesus and enjoy uh, the Scriptures together. Uh, Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Her clothing is fine linen. Sorry, she makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates. When he sits among the elders of the land, he makes linen garments, sorry, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently but you surpass them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, And we want to bow ourselves underneath your word and ask that you would submit us to all that it teaches. And then we pray and ask that you would so work in our hearts that we find everything you teach to be beautiful and lovely and liberating and exactly what we were meant for, in fact, better than we ever dreamed of. Lord, we are aware of how deep a work it requires for that to happen. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would be powerfully at work and on the offense this morning, working in our midst to conform us to the image of Christ. 
We pray this, just confessing our own weakness, our own sinfulness, and your great goodness that's running after us when we hear your word preached. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Proverbs 31, this last section of the book of Proverbs, is a poem. And it's actually a fairly complicated kind of poem. We don't teach it as a complicated poem here in North America. When we do acrostic poems, usually somewhere in middle school, uh, they're usually nothing to be remembered about. You know, it's not something you really want to remember, your first acrostic poem. But if you do remember them, they're the kind of poems that start with an A, and then a B, and then a C, and the, the next line is going to start with a D. And this entire poem, Proverbs chapter 31, uh, at least from verses uh, 10 to the end of the chapter, is, is exactly like that. It takes the entire Hebrew alphabet, and each letter is given a line, and each line tells us some, something exemplary, something glorious about this remarkable woman that's often called the Proverbs 31 woman. So I tell you that, I tell you that it's got this sort of structure and this intense uh, poetic focus to assure you that this is not just some 20-year-old guy sitting at home at night wondering, uh, writing down his list of what the ultimate woman would be like. Uh, this, these words actually come to us from God the Father Himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to give a clear picture of what uh, John Angel James would call female piety. What it would look like for a godly woman to be at the top of her game. What it would look like for a woman, in all the callings God has given her, especially the call of wife and mother, to really be excelling. Um, this poem that's got so much beauty packed into it is a poem that many people have a hard time rejoicing in. It's not something that's immediately looked upon as good. Some works of art, you look at them and immediately, that's good, that's very good. Other, maybe I'm dating myself, other tapes uh, you may get or CDs or however you get your music, needs a few listens before you actually start to get the groove of what's going on and really begin to appreciate the beauty of what you're hearing. Proverbs 31 can be like that. It's not immediately beautiful to everyone. And for many people, Proverbs 31 is a turnoff because of this woman's perfections. She's so good. You may read Proverbs 31 and notice that she has servants, and you can be like, yeah, if I had servants, I'd be that good too. Just the high bar that she raises can be off-putting and can make what's beautiful actually appear ugly. And to that, I just want to give you this one challenge. I want to remind you, before we delve into the depths of this poem, that excellence isn't only condemning, but excellence can be inspiring. Are there, more, are there less young men who want to play football because Tom Brady is a great quarterback? No, in fact, there are overweight middle-aged men going, number 12 drops back into the pocket, Excellence sort of invites everyone to participate in the beauty of the raised bar. Are there less young women who want to play tennis because Serena Williams has dominated tennis for the last decade? Absolutely not. Greatness invites us to participate in what 99.9% .9 of us will never be that good at. But we're better because of the best. And this woman is the goat of womanhood. She is the greatest of all time. Hands down, no doubt about it. And so there is a sense in which we need to recognize that. 
We need to recognize that as we look at her and notice her, that we're dealing with the best of the best of the best of the best. She, she got that title 3,000 years ago and no one has challenged since. But in raising the bar, she ennobles. The philosophy behind most TV shows these days is tell it like it really is. Be honest. Be real. Be gritty. And so if teenagers are smoking meth and have sex all the time, make shows that show those teenagers smoking meth and having sex all the time. Well, the Bible understands this desire to be real and to be honest. But when the Bible is real and honest about failures, it's very chaste. Because the Bible knows that when you display what's debased, you actually debase. When you set before your eyes what's low, you don't just get in touch with what's real, you go down. And we're at a point right now in our culture where anyone who lifts up virtue and lifts up the person who chooses to do what is right and lifts up the person who's pursuing excellence, that's viewed as hopelessly naive and Pollyannish. But for Christians, it ought not to be that way. We should have it deep in our souls that we ought to focus on whatever is good and lovely and true and noble. Even if nobody gets as high and as true and as pure and as noble as they ought, focusing your mind on what is better or what is best actually allows you to participate a little more in what's better. So, this poem gives us this picture of the ultimate wife, the ultimate woman. And we might be put off with her perfections, but we shouldn't be. We should learn to value excellence in example. Other people might come to Proverbs 31 and be put off by her passions. Not by her perfections, but by her passions. What does she do? She serves her husband all day long. She does him good and not harm 365 days a year forever. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. And then, later on in the passage, she looks well to her household. You know, oh boy, here we go again. The, the Bible teaching the little ladies to go to their little homes and do their little lady things. And what you've got here is a classic example of the Bible limiting women, domineering, oppressing, limiting and caging in all of their capacity. Thank you, preacher, with just what we needed. Well, I will concede to you that the Bible has a pointed focus for every wife, towards her husband, and towards her household. Paul tells Titus that every woman is to be taught to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. I'll give you that. But I won't give you that it's done in little homes by little ladies. This woman, and I'm just, I'm just sort of giving you the broad strokes here. This woman is involved in mercantile exchange. She takes the raw goods of wool and flax and puts them, makes them into raw materials. Then she can make scarlet bed covers. Oh, you're just into, into household decorating. She sells real estate. What kind of real estate? Viticulture. She buys gardens to make wine. Like, Hi, honey, this is, this is a good year. It's your best. She's, she's rising early to do human resource work with the servants she's hired. She's doing social work when she raise, reaches out her hand to the poor. You've got an unbelievably multi-competent, gifted woman actually doing such diverse tasks that you, you couldn't get a job where you get to do all these things in one place. So she's no little lady, and she's no, 
She's not operating in a little home. She's operating in homes that raise the next generation. We'll look at this. Empower her husband to be in the city square. And on top of that, actually serve as social services to the poverty in the, in the, in the city. It's an unbelievable possibility. So, some people might be offended by Proverbs 31 because of this woman's perfections. Others might not be too attracted to Proverbs 31 because of this woman's passions. They seem behind the times, antiquated. Others might be put off of the Proverbs 31 woman because they don't see her possibilities. Now, up until this point, I have been applying Proverbs 31 to all the wrong people. As many people have heard me say in different contexts, and I've been waiting for the opportunity to say this on a Sunday morning for so long, Proverbs 31 was not written to women. Christians love to teach Proverbs 31 to women. They love to fill their bookstores with purses, with Proverbs 31 embroidered on them. Proverbs 31 has got to be on the short end of like women tattoos. It's, it's, it's all be the Proverbs 31 woman. And yet, Proverbs 31 is not primarily addressed to women at all. The primary focus of Proverbs 31 is men. The main people who see women wrongly are us, brothers. The main people who don't get what women are and can be is not the women. It's the men. And I say that this passage is addressed primarily to the men because of two facts. The first is the structure of the whole book of Proverbs. What is the chorus of the book of Proverbs? Two words, my son. My son. My boy. Proverbs 31 is dad taking his son out back for a talk. 30 chapters of it. Proverbs chapter two, uh, one verse eight, my son. Proverbs chapter two verse one, my son. Proverbs chapter three verse one, my son. And it goes on like that throughout the book. Proverbs Proverbs is a book written by Solomon the king acting as a father to the nation to his boys, to the national youth of Israel. And he's speaking to the sons. And when we get to the Proverbs 31, nothing's changed. It's the young men who are being addressed. And the clincher for what I'm saying is the first verse of Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31 has a unique heading over it. We know that Solomon, who wrote the whole book, actually wrote some of it by accumulating it from other writers. There's actually evidence of Egyptian wisdom literature in the Proverbs. Solomon wasn't afraid of wisdom wherever he could get it. And the Holy Spirit owned some of that wisdom and placed it here in the Scriptures. And we're told in Proverbs chapter 31 that what we have in this chapter is the words of King Lemuel, a king we know much less about than we know about Solomon. And these words of King Lemuel come from an oracle that his mother taught him. So King Lemuel, in bed, by the fireside, at the breakfast table, had mom just talking to him all the time. She was talking to him. King Lemuel's mom was always talking to him. And she was talking to him so much that he could later condense what she could say into one chapter of the book of Proverbs and one acrostic poem that used every letter of the Bible, of the Hebrew alphabet. Imagine, young man, if at the end of your 18 years with your mom, you said, you know what, I think I'll accumulate a poem now of everything my mom ever taught me about the right kind of woman to look for. That would be a gift, and some of you ladies should start talking proactively to your sons about what they ought to be looking for in a woman. Okay, so here's what's happening. Proverbs, my son, my son, my son, my son. Proverbs 31, Lemuel, here's what you're looking for, Lemuel. Here's what you're after, Lemuel. There's a wrong kind of woman. She's been described amply in the first 30 chapters. 
And there's another kind of lady. And she's the one you want. And why does Lemuel need to be taught what to look for in a woman? I mean, almost any man on the planet could say, I know what I'm looking for in a woman. So why do men need specific teaching on what to look for in a woman? Because men look for all the wrong things when they look for a wife. And Lemuel's mom shows she, she understands men. She, she's, she's been around a few men. She understands men. And I think she summarizes why she would need to write Proverbs chapter 31 in verse 30. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. I think the modern translation of that is, man, we have a lot of chemistry, and she's really, really gorgeous. And uh, Lemuel's mom says, chemistry? I'll trick you. The only people who can be fun and charming all the time is people who have Hollywood screenwriters write their lines for them. Okay, the only reason, the only way you can come up with something clever to say at all points is if someone sat around as a full-time job pretending they were you and feeding you your lines. The rest of us are not that interesting. And beauty is vain. It's like a flower. It's, it's good for a moment. And <laughs> now, there are balancing things that I could say about the importance of connection in a relationship and beauty. But I'm not going to say them today because Lemuel's mom didn't have time for them because she was like, listen, listen, listen. Charm is deceitful. You guys are all about the charm. And you're going to get tricked. And you're going to pick the wrong woman. And beauty, how important is beauty? Lemuel's mom standing there. Useless. Now, someone can say, you should balance that out. Yes, I should, but not today. Because we haven't got this balance. When was the last time you, got a, you met a guy who was walking through life going, it's useless, beauty's useless, I just need character. Give me character or give me death. <laughs> when Emmanuel is flooded with those men, I'll preach the balance. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, ooh la la. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I know I'm just warming up and I'm taking a long time to warm up. Uh, those of you who've been around Emmanuel a long time go, oh, this is an old school sermon. We're doing the two hour long introduction. So here we go. <laughs> Proverbs can, set, can just look like the most chauvinistic book you ever saw. It's from a dad to his son. Where's the woman part? Not there. My son, my son, my son, my son. Who is this guy? What world is this coming out of? And then to cap it all off, hey, let me tell you what woman you should pick. We misread Proverbs radically if we see it as chauvinistic. Because before this guy's even given one chance to look at the ideal woman, he's had to face himself for 30 chapters of dad behind the woodshed, giving him what for on every issue of life. Now think about it. Think, think about it. If you... Because here's how, here's how men misuse Proverbs 31. Okay. Now I'm to judge each of you biblically. Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. 
Lampstand went out. No, okay. No real estate dealings. No. Scarlet bed coverings. Nope. Guess I'll be single till I die because there's nobody around. But you gotta remember, before you get to Proverbs 31, the dad spent 30 chapters getting the log out of his son's eye before he spends half a chapter teaching him how to maybe discern a speck in the ideal woman's eye. He teaches the guys how to parent. Right? My son! You gotta train these kids or they're gonna go to hell and make your life miserable. He teaches the son how to balance the checkbook and do finances. He teaches the son how not to be lazy. He teaches the son how to honor authority. He teaches the son how to not get in with a gang. He teaches the son how to deal, how to avoid an immoral woman. And then once the son is thoroughly raked over the coals by the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, and that's the woman you're looking for. You see the difference? There's a lot of talk right now in the culture on social media about how to raise up men. The manosphere will offer all kinds of teaching on how to be a real man. Brothers, we got 30 chapters of Proverbs. God-centered chapters of Proverbs. The deal, they will not make you some abstract theologian. But they get you right into the weeds of everyday life. And then at the end of it, they go, now you, guy who read the first 30 chapters, I'm assuming you read the first, you did not skip to the 31st chapter, did you? Because if you skip to the 31st chapter, you're going to come at this like you're the judge and jury over every woman's biblical Biblicalness? <laughs> but if you go through the first 30 chapters, at least I think about what the effect would be on my own soul, you're good and humbled before you start evaluating which lucky lady could be with you. Now look at this woman. I'm going to give you four points about her. She is of precious value. She's of precious value. Verses 10, 11, and 12. An excellent wife, who can find? Pop culture, some women are referred to as easy. Why are they referred to easy, as easy? Because they are. Easy to find, easy to get, easy to have. Not this woman. She's rare. She's hard to find. She's not a dime a dozen. She's not growing on every tree. She has to be created by the Holy Spirit. She can be created from any background. God can make a woman like this no matter how bad or how good her past was. But this woman is rare. And she's far more precious than jewels. Now, it's, it, it's easy to take that figuratively. She's like a diamond ring. No, when we get into Proverbs, you're going to see, no, she's actually financially beneficial. She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her. Now, if you know, if you're a Bible reader, you know that one of the main things the Bible is always on about is not trusting in man. Can you think of a higher compliment than for God to allow this in His Word? You can be the kind of woman that a man could put trust in. And he will, get, he will have no lack of gain. Again, don't take it figuratively as we get into the depths of Proverbs 31. It's literal. He will have no lack of gain. She does him good 
and not harm, except when she's having me time. No. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. This passage displays the same orientation that we find throughout the Bible. It assumes it here, but it's it's the orientation that a husband is the head of a home and a wife is to submit to his leadership and come along and serve the way he's leading. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. And I know I'm preaching to 2022 people that the the initial soul reaction each of us are going to have is, okay, I'm serving him. I'm doing him good, not harm. I'm benefiting him. What's with that? And I would say, before you ask that question abstractly, I would ask you just to stop and remember what Bob Dylan taught the world. You're going to serve somebody. Somebody. You may be the ambassador to England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Okay, so that's the given. So here are your choices. You can serve you. How's that going for people these days? I'm all in it for me. And you got people who don't know who me is, don't know whether they're getting it right or wrong, and certainly haven't found happiness. Well, if you choose the Lord, what you find is you're serving a Lord who has prescribed natural relationships. That's the way he's done it. It's good. It's good. He's prescribed relationships for the way children relate to parents, for the way uh, for the way pastors relate to people, for the way governments relate to people, and for the way husbands relate to wives. And so really embracing this calling of serving Him is not something limiting or crippling. It's something that means you're following in God's path and embracing the natural order that He designed for your good. But, now, Here, here, this is important. This is important. This is really important. Because our culture is so messed up on men and women right now, Christians think they're doing something really radical by saying men ought to lead their homes. If you travel across this world, that's not radical. Men leading is the way things work when you leave things naturally. It's only the aberrations, bizarre cultures like our own where that gets all messed up. General pattern of the planet is the men lead. That's not what's distinctively Christian. What's distinctively Christian is that men crucify themselves and serve others in their leadership. That they love. That's what's distinctively Christian. Distinctively Christian is not men lead. That's just natural law. What's distinctively Christian is husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, if that's the case, and I'm going to bring this back around, not get too far afield. I know we haven't gotten to the depths of the meat of the passage yet. We're going to get more into it. But I just want to talk a little bit more about if you've got this headship submission relationship, it's really important you get this right. Because you can get it like this. Well, he's the head, so he gets to do all the thinking and making all the decisions, and he wears the pants, and she's the gopher, and she she implements whatever he wants to do, and so he gets to have the brains, and she gets to do the work, and isn't it glory to God? And the best thing I read about this week, I just love this, is it might be better to conceive of this more like a head coach and a quarterback. A quarterback on an NFL football team, we'll we'll go with Tom Brady again. I know some of you, there's hatred rising, others, the feelings of love, I know, but you can deal with it, okay? And I know he doesn't play for Bill Belichick anymore, but for a long time, the great quarterback-coach relationship is Bill Belichick, Tom Brady. Now, do you think Bill Belichick is telling Tom Brady 
every little detail of everything he ought to do. Just micro, just in his ear the whole time. No, just step back a little bit. No, don't run, you're bad at that. No, like, do you think that's what's happening? No, Tom Brady is a high capacity, highly skilled individual who's being led by a coach, but is being led to use all kinds of skill. And so in the headship submission relationship, you're not talking about the brains of the operation and the gopher. You're not talking about that. Not in a healthy marriage. You're talking about a situation where yes, a husband has a leadership role and a headship role and an ultimate authority role, but he's been given another human being made in the image of God with brains coming out of her ears and capacity and wisdom and skills and and, and just all kinds of abilities. Some of you like that brain coming to the ears image. I see that, but sorry about that. You get the idea. And so you're dealing with a, a, a man who's clearly in leadership here, he's assumed for much of this passage, but he's not leading a robot. He's leading a woman who can do real estate and social relief. He's leading a woman who knows how to value out her merchandise and sell it at the highest profit. You're dealing with a highly capable woman. Second point, she's of precious value to She's productive and profitable. She's productive and profitable. Notice uh, in verse 13, she rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household. I'm sorry, I can't go all the way down there. Notice uh, verse 13. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses her strength self with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. Walk backwards through that. She sees that the things she makes are worth money and she sells them at a profit. She's highly involved in the financial advance of this family and she's able to assess value and make a profit. Verse 12, verse 17, she's not a waif. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Verse 16, she does real estate horticultural development, and viticulture, all in one verse. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her plant hands, she plants a vineyard. What'd you do today, honey? Bought the field down the road, got it planted with grapes, thinking it's going to be a good year. She's not lazy. She rises while it's yet night and provides food for a household and portions for a maiden. So she's doing delegation. She's overseeing an economic household that requires the people to be fed and empowered to go and do what they're called to do. She's exemplary. Her grocery shopping is amazing. Verse 14. She's like the ships of the merchants. She brings her food from afar. Some of you men need to go home and open the fridge and just count how many countries are represented in your fridge today, right? Look, I got this Dublin, Ireland cheese and some hummus from Greece and just unbelievable. Where did she get all this stuff? And she's brought this all in for the care of her family. This is what's being spoken of when it talks about her being a jewel, when it talks about her bringing profit. It's talking about how she actually adds to the financial value and the health and the food and the eating of the home. Now, I think this says something to the secular woman, and it says something to the conservative Christians. To the secular woman, it says, yeah, we're all about women deeply engaged in real estate, and uh, mercantile development, you name it, high-skilled activities. 
that produce real wealth. And yet we believe those things ought to be subservient to and revolve around the home. If they compromise the home, if they take a a woman away from husband and children, they've really eroded what they were meant to do. This woman's highly skilled. She's not divorced from home life. To the conservative Christian, I would say this. It seems like we often talk like the ideal is for men to be 100% responsible for the financial advance of the home and 100% the breadwinners. And it's sort of a compromise if a woman's involved in that end of things at all. You're just not going to be able to make it through Proverbs 31 with that kind of a conservatism. She's bringing part of the profit and the value and the equity to the home. If, if there's any sort of value-added investments or equity that have happened in the Fullerton home, I'll tell you right now, I've been, here for, I've been at this Fullerton home for 23 years or so, they've got Christy Fullerton's name written all over them. Third, she's a beautiful blessing. She's a beautiful blessing. Uh, Bruce Waltke, probably the foremost commentator on Proverbs 31, makes the point that in verse 19, we kind of have a transition And the transition goes from how she's making all these things. She's making resources by planting a vineyard, by developing uh, wool and flax. And then in verse 19, we move to sort of what she does with the money she's produced. What she does with the resources she's produced. And and maybe you can hear, he he points out verse 19 is sort of the transition in the poem. Notice the use of hands four times. She puts her hands to the distaff. That's how you wove wool, or it's one of the tools in weaving wool and whatnot. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. And Walkie points out that here's the transition. She's using her hands, highly skilled, to make a profit. And what's the first thing that happens with the fruit of her hands? It's not her immediate family. The first thing that happens is that her resources go to the poor. Which is exactly the pattern Paul sets down for the Christian in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, let the thief no longer steal, but let him do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to give. You know, conservative types talk a lot about the government getting their hands out of social services out of welfare. But we really have to talk a good game, don't we? If we're going to say that. Because instead of just big government offices that minister to the nameless poor, we need a thousand homes. A thousand homes where the resources are hands outstretched to care for the poor. What an amazing thing it would be if, if every husband and wife at Emmanuel were on that page. Yeah, I want to use part of a resource so you can reach your hands out to care for the needy. What what developed and textured and intimate care we would be able to give to the various people in need we might meet. She's a beautiful blessing. She blesses her, her family with beauty. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. There's maybe one balancing comment. This woman's not dressed in rags. She's making some purple clothes for herself, which is royal. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She frees her husband up for greater leadership in the broader culture. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. I gotta skip ahead. Last point. She is given appropriate affirmation. She's given appropriate affirmation. It says this in verse 22. Sorry, in verse 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed. 
her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let her work praise her in the gates. It's amazing, this book that's so dedicated to telling the sons what to do ends with sons who praise their wives and call their children to praise their wives as well. And I I was so convicted of not having done that enough with my own children and my own wife that I, I thought I would actually read you something that someone else wrote that I found particularly convicting. This may be the longest quote I've ever read in 20 some years, but it's so good. And what it's about, men, is the ministry of affirmation that we need to have to our wives. I'll just read it. This is Ray Ortland Jr. Some of us men might be feeling, I haven't trusted and valued and affirmed my wife as she deserved. And you should be feeling that if you haven't said regularly, I praise you. I praise your excellence. Let's think about that. Because the primary message here in the book of Proverbs is for husbands and husbands-to-be, which is nearly all of us men, what does the word husband mean? We have, treat, we have the related English word husbandry, and that is cultivation. And the word, the word husband is used as a verb. It means to cultivate. If you're a husband, here is your job, to cultivate and nurture your wife. Your lifetime impact on your wife should be that her life opens up more and more, and she is enabled to become all that God wants her to be. God is calling you as her husband so to care for her that in her later years, in her later years, she will be thinking, what a great life I've had. My husband understood me. He cared for me. He inspired me to grow in Christ. He's praising her in the gates. He's celebrating her. He's affirming her to such a degree that Later on in life, she's going, man, what a great life I've had being with this guy. How does a husband do that? Not by browbeating his wife. Man, is every guy listening to me? Because I need this so much. And I'm kind of just banking on the fact that you do too. How does a husband do that? Not by browbeating his wife. God doesn't treat us that way, but by encouraging her here. It's here in Proverbs 31. He says, her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. When was the last time your wife heard that from you? You surpass them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Her children, this is Ray Ortland Jr. again, rise up and call her blessed. They stand up. They speak respectfully to their mom. They tell her why they esteem her, why they admire her as a woman of God. Where did the kids learn that? From dad. He praises her. Verse 28. The key word in these verses is praise. It appears three times in these verses. A husband cultivates his wife by setting a high tone of praise in the home. No put-downs. No fault-finding. No insults. Not even neutral silence. But rather bright, positive, life-giving praise. The picture here is of the wise woman giving herself to her family and to others, and she is receiving praise from her husband and children at home and from her community in the gates. God wants to fill our homes and our churches with this beautiful wisdom where men are not passive, but overtly cultivating the excellence of their wives. And these women are thriving. What is it that the wise husband says? Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Men, how does your wife excel? Tell her. Tell her in front of the children. Have this conversation at the dinner table tonight, 
and tomorrow night. And if you cannot think of any way in which your wife excels and truly deserves to be praised, then that's your fault. Because God has called you to husband her in excellence. You can't say, I'm not married to the goat. You have to ask, what, what's she good at? And how can I praise her for that? The word excellently in verse 29 is the same word translated excellent in verse 10. God wants to see your wife become more and more capable because of your influence in her life and he wants to hear you and your kids cheering her all the way. One of the saddest things, as Christy and I have talked about this verse and these realities, is, is for me to see ways I've been critical of her lack of productivity but then to realize ways my criticism has con contributed to that lack of fruitfulness and productivity. What would happen if we were just all about praising the excellencies of our wives, fanning them up into flame, encouraging them? What would happen? Man, this is not a pep talk. This is the gospel. This is about God. How you see God inevitably will show up in how you treat your family. Brothers, this is, this doesn't get you like you got me. You can fake it at work, but you cannot fake it at home. How you really see God, not what you're supposed to believe about God, but what you really believe will show up in how you treat your wife. A.W. Tozer wrote, the essence of idolatry is the entertainment of thoughts about God that are unworthy of him. If your concept of God is beneath who He really is, then you will have unworthy thoughts about your wife and unworthy words to her. And the problem is not her. The root problem is your Jesus is not the real Jesus. Your Jesus is not big enough to set you free. If you cannot bring yourself to praise your wife and you live with her in silent, sullen, defeated melancholy, there is a reason. The reason is how you see Christ. It may be that you have no complaints about Him. He may seem to you an unobjectionable Savior, but if you have no passion for Him, it's because you do not see in Him mighty passion for you and a mighty salvation for you and a glorious future for you. That vision of Christ is unworthy of Him. The truth is the Lord Jesus Christ is a glorious Savior. He closes with this story. My dad grew up in a Swedish-American home where they did not express love as freely as he desired. They were good people, but it just wasn't their way to open up about the deep feelings of the heart. But it is God's way. Dad understood that about God. So when dad got married and started his home, he made a decision. He, he, des he decided to launch a new tradition. And I grew up in a home where we openly expressed our love for each other. It did not take three or four generations for this newness to evolve. Dad changed it suddenly because of who God is. Some of my best memories of the family sitting around the dinner table and dad saying, let's take time now to affirm each other. I read that and I texted my kids and said, okay, we need to do this next time we get together. We still haven't done it, so pray for me. He set that loving tone. It was the gospel at work in our home. That's what God can do for your family starting today. Men, let's repent of our silence and the sin of withheld love. Have we robbed our families of the love they deserve? Have we truly and worthily represented Christ to our families? Or have we in effect denied the gospel in our homes? And here's a basic principle for us men. If we don't get radical, nothing will ever change. Christ got radical for you at the cross and it changed everything forever. And he put you with your wife because he loves her. And he put you with her as a mighty blessing to her. So get radical, start changing, begin a new tradition in your home starting today. If you step out in a new obedience, the Lord will help you and your family will rejoice over you. So here's how we're going to do the Lord's Supper today. Jeff, I'm pulling an audible. If you can listen to all this and not have extreme guilt, you're a, well, I don't know what you are, but it's not good. But in the midst of all of this, 
beating behind every convicting exhortation is that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. If you are a woman who made yourself cheap, this bread and this cup reminds you that he shed his blood for you to purchase you. If you're a husband who is almost impossible to eke a compliment out of and your wife is getting more and more battered over the years by your browbeating and your judgment, there's forgiveness for you. If you're a woman whose heart, whose husband can't trust you, not because he's picky, but because you're not trustworthy, you lie. You're not out for his good. There's forgiveness for you. If you're a couple and you are like, the car ride home is going to be bad, 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 bad. And you got a list and he's got a list and we are ready to do some list comparisons and some contract negotiations. That's not how the Christian life works. You can forgive each other. You can forgive each other even as God in Christ forgave you. If you're a man who keeps reading Proverbs 31 and keeps finding no women quite good enough for you, you can go back and read the other 30 chapters and be forgiven for your judgmental attitude. If you're a woman who's too progressive to say, that's a good woman to marry, I'll try to be like that. You can be forgiven. There is forgiveness with Jesus Christ. His death on the cross offers forgiveness. And this bread and this cup says that forgiveness is for you for the sins exposed this morning. So good. So, if you have repented and believed in Christ, keep repenting and believing in Christ. And come take this meal. If you are walking in fellowship with a local church, this meal is a continual reminder that we need fresh forgiveness. If you've not been baptized, be baptized. Come to Jesus Christ. Be immersed in water as a sign that you believe in him and you will receive the forgiveness of your sins. And if you've done that, this meal is for you to remind you of the forgiveness of your sins. And then as you take this meal, utter, offer up this prayer. Lord, would you help me to know your forgiveness and to endeavor after new obedience? especially you men. Resolve now to find the best in your wife and to praise her for it, to lead your children to praise her for it, to affirm her, to extol her. If you aren't going to lead in celebrating biblical womanhood, who on the planet is? You think they're going to find a Netflix documentary that affirms this? No. Not out there. You can flip through all the channels. No one's going to say, here's the Proverbs 31 woman. We all think it's awesome. Men don't lead in it. It's not happening. Let's pray. As I pray, those who are going to serve the Lord's Supper can come and take the bread and take the cup. And those of you in the center section will come down the center aisle. Those of you on the sides and up here will come down the side aisles. We'll take the bread. We'll take the cup. And here's the most important part. As we take the bread and we take the cup, we will remember the Lord's forgiving death until He comes. Father, we come before you and ask you to please meet Emmanuel with special, forgiving, empowering grace this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.